One second before. Today is May 27th, 1998. This is an interview with Henry de Krieger, and the interviewer is Lenore Bienenfeld Weinstein. The interview takes place in Carl Gables, Florida, in the United States, and the language is English. This is the first tape. My name is Lenore Bienenfeld Weinstein. Today's date is May 27, 1998. I am conducting an interview with Henry de Krieger, and the interview takes place in Carl Gables, Florida, in the United States, and the language is English. Can you please tell me your name? Henry de Krieger. Would you spell your name for me? Small d-e, capital K-R-Y-G-E-R. -E First name? Henry. Middle name too? Cornelius. Can you spell Henry Cornelius for H -E -N -R -I, me? H-E-N-R-I, and then C-O-R-N-E-L-I-S. How is your name pronounced at home? De Krieger. But nobody can hear. Do you go by any other names or nicknames? I used to be in Holland known as ha Hans. For a while he also, but it was taken over by my original name Henry and it stayed that way. Even people that knows me for 40, 50 years now call me Henry also. Seems to be easier in the mouth. What is your date of birth? October 30, 1919. And how old does that make you today? 78, almost 79, coming up. What city were you born in? Rotterdam. And which country is that in? In Holland. What were your parents' names? My father was André Isidore Victor de Krijger, and my mother was Maria Smits. Where did your father's family come from? Oh, that from? was not Maria, it was Cornelia. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you asked me another question. Where did your father's family come from? I think it was The Hague. Yeah, The and, Hague. And your mother's family? Rotterdam. What are some of your early memories of your mother? Nothing. She died when I was about two years and a few months after the birth of my younger brother. And I think he was about a little more over a year when she passed away. So I don't have any memory of my mother. We are brought up as housekeepers. And how would you describe your father's personality? Uh, very tidy, very much uh, everything clean and everything good. And, I, and yeah, when you're so young, you don't really much about his attitude to us that you, that must be much later when we said, well, he was good or bad. He was good for his children. As a matter of fact, he never wanted to remarry because he was very young, not to have his three children have a stepmother that may then later on have another child and then not so good for the three children that were not her children and that he avoided by not getting married. He did marry, remarry till we were all grown up and out of the house. Then he started, he remarried. What are the names of the other children in your family? My sister is uh, Eugenie, Henriette Isabella, and my younger brother is Kees, K-E-E-S, nothing else. What was your family life like when you were growing up? Well, it was just moving from one housekeeper to another. So we had always some other people to love or to be loved by, and that was not too easy. But then you took that from almost, well, this is it. We never knew the love of a mother. So it, it was always sort of different. When we were very young, and that I don't remember, we were, uh, I won't say adopted, we were brought up by my father's sister and her husband. And she 
took care of us when we were real young, like two, three, four years old. And that was in the very beginning, but I don't remember anything about that time, absolutely nothing, till my father moved from, and that was in The Hague, and then he moved to Rotterdam and started to get housekeepers to take care of the three children. And then we lived for a long time with housekeepers. What did your father do for a living? He was always in the uh, representing companies that sold things for construction. He was a long time also representing a uh, place that was uh, that was new in those days, parquet floors in new buildings, and he was represented and selling that to uh, construction businesses. And that was actually always his his business, never anything else. And uh, merchandise that was used in ho building homes. I don't know how you describe that better, actually, but that was it. What was your family's religious background? Well, my mother was Catholic, and my father was what we call, it's a religion that I would think is neither Duits hervormed. I don't know what, this, what it is here, but it was not Catholic. It's more the Protestant section of the Protestant religion. What brought, actually, the fact that we were never brought up very religious. We were never really going to church, and he, uh, well, he didn't do very much on religion himself, and he didn't want also to accept the Catholic religion of my mother. So we were actually not brought up any religiously, not at all. But also was not too good a relationship with his uh, in-laws, or uh, this is the father and mother of my mother. They were Catholic, of course, and that was, they didn't, were too happy that their daughter married a non-Catholic man. But it never was any problem in the family, because we, we were so young when she died that the religious part was over, and we never really brought up very religiously, not at all. Did you have any relationship with your mother's parents? Yeah, for a while, her mother was still alive, and I still remember that one of our housekeepers always walked with us, that was about an hour and a half, or maybe two hours, to the house of my grandmother, that I remember very vaguely, very vague, not very much. But I remember that we did make those walks on Sunday to visit my grandmother. But that is all very vague and I see little parts of it in my memory but not much. I never can even remember sitting there with her or having, uh, giving us presents or what the grandmothers do. That didn't, doesn't ring a bell at all. Grandfathers I never knew. My father's parents I never knew. Not his mother, not his father. What were the names of your aunt and uncle that took care of you early That years? was his sister. That was aunt, her name was Mies, M-I-E-S. And the uncle was Uncle Leo. Very wonderful people. He was a very nice man and they did, did very well. And that was also the reason that my grandmother was not too happy that my father selected those people as our caretakers because they were not Catholic. And that brought also a little trouble between him and his mother-in-law, that the, the children were under, I don't know how you call that, when they take care of the children. It is a word for it, but okay. But they, uh, they took care of us, and that was Aunt Mies and Uncle Leo. Did you maintain a relationship with them after? Yeah, very long, till, unfortunately, then the war started, he turned to be Nazi. And that was the end of it. When you were a child, do you remember having a role model? 
no. What about as a young adult? No. What kind of schooling did you have? I went in Holland to the uh, elementary school for six years. But no, only four or five, I don't remember, was then we moved from Rotterdam to The Hague. And there I finished elementary school about two more years, I think. And then I went to a, a school that sort of continued the six years. You went to sevens or eights. And then I went to a, uh, what they call it, a more, uh, yeah, a little higher school than the elementary. And I went there for four years. And that was it. And I finished when I was about 16, I think, finished school. Did you belong to any groups or clubs when you were? Well, we had a little fun club from the school. And we did, uh, every Saturday night, we had rented a, a sort of a large, a little room, or not a little room, a large room. And we had dancing. So we all dated the girls and the and the boys were all from that one school. We got together on Saturday night dancing. And then we went on, uh, uh, that was nice. We went under the name of Fantasia. And we went to little hike trips that was organized by the city or something for maybe 20 kilometer or 25 kilometer. And we always rode up for that. And we went with about 20 or 30 of the members of that group. We went hiking and we, when we finished you got a little plaque for that uh, and that was about it that was all the thing that were going in those days there was not anything of sports I mean besides the walking but that was it I was not much interested in other sports anyway as a child now everybody's playing baseball and basketball and all that what did you do when you finished school I started to work right away because my father thought that uh, it was also bad times and there was not too much income and it was good for me to start working and I went as my first job in one of, a, of the largest department store and I remember that they had asked for uh, students, actually they called it Leerling, student to start in the retail business. And I went with my father for an introduction or an application, whatever. And uh, it was in the furniture department. And I came there with my father. And I still remember that the lady that was interviewing me was quite a sort of a, she was very masculine. And it seems that she saw Furniture is too heavy for that boy. He looks more like fabrics. She said, I have an opening for him in fabrics because I think he would be much happier with handling fabrics than moving furniture around. So my father said, okay. So I made 10 guilders a month, what was like $2 a month was my first salary. But of course, that was quite a while ago. And it was normal salary for somebody that was learning. So I started in that business and I had to work with, it was a big Jewish business, this Bayenkorf is very well known. They had stores in Amsterdam and in The Hague. And in, uh, no, not Rotterdam, Rotterdam got later. But I got my first job then in The Hague where we lived. And I was there the, the youngest and my boss started to teach me right away how to dress mannequins, you know, those stiff ladies and have to make dresses and whatever comes and I always made everything very beautiful and I loved it. And uh, then you start to get promotions a little bit and they 
put you up in a section where they sell what we call little leftovers. They were all nicely packed up with a label on it. There was one yard of this, two yards for a special price. And that before they put you in the big section of selling, like fabrics, people that come in and needed stuff for a gown or for a dress or whatever. You start selling those little things. So that's where I started. Before the war years, what was the relationship of your community with uh, Jewish people? We never made it a point they were Jewish or not. There, there, there was no difference if they were Jewish or, or Gentiles. Uh, so it was always, it was normal, like, like with everybody else, we never made it. He's a Jew or he is not. All my co-workers were Jewish. I can almost say maybe two or three were not. I was in that department with maybe with 25 people, including my manager and my co-manager. They were all Jewish. And all the people, two or three were not. But there was never any, any, any discussion. We never made any difference. So it was good. <laughs> Do you recall when um, Hitler came to power in Germany? Yes. But also we felt, what do we have to do with it? That's very bad for Germany and very bad, well, maybe not bad. Germany was in a terrible disarray. Germany almost was ready for somebody to do better and to make people come back, there was an enormous, uh, uh, there was no, no work, there was, it was bad. And then he started to give that image, I can save this country, and it looked like it. Till he started to go a very mean direction. He started to blame the Jews for everything that went wrong, what he was trying to do better. And that, of course, we were aware of but all very sad about it and very sick about it, but couldn't do nothing. And then come the Kristallnacht, when he started really to be bad. And especially Holland was you know, very shocked about all that. But the whole world was shocked about it, not just Holland. We reacted the same as Belgium and France and Italy and everybody else. Maybe not Italy, because Mussolini was there having the, the war. So it went on and on and on, and nothing could be done. Only a lot of German Jews fled to Holland. So we had a lot of people, Germans, that would still be able to get over the borders. And they fled to Belgium and France, wherever there was, was no Hitler. And then a lot of them went also to Cuba. That's why there are so many German Jews in Cuba, and they were all in the textile business. Did your life change in any way during this period of time before the war? No. No, because you knew what was happening, but you couldn't do anything about it. And still also, we were young. You know, we were not in politics. I mean, uh, I was only like 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. So it didn't affect us. So then you maybe read the paper, you see a headline and all bad things. There was no television, so you were never confronted with so much problems. Sometimes you didn't even read the paper. It's television that brought us now to everything that's happening in the world. And no radio. There was nothing. The only, my father played the piano. It was the only entertainment we had. Were you ever called into the military? No. Well, yes, I did. And I have to go through a uh, exam. But when I told him that my mother died of tuberculosis, I was finished immediately. They didn't want me there. They were afraid I had the gene and would spread tuberculosis over the Dutch army or something. And I was so glad because I hated the idea to have to wear a uniform that was made out of a prickly wool and I could just feel that on up my neck and I can't stand anything. I couldn't wear wool socks, never anything wool. I said, oh my God, I don't have to go in the army. I couldn't say lucky my mother died of tuberculosis, but that was the reason. And then my, uh, and because when one in the family is called up, the brother, younger brother, 
doesn't have to go either. And even if I was not going into it, he didn't have to go either because I was already called up as the one in the family that has to go in the army. So he never had to go either. So I never went in the army. What was your relationship like with your brother and sister? Well, yeah, we were brought up actually with housekeepers till my father, he finally decided I'm sick and tired of the housekeepers. He, he told my sister to take care of us. Well, that went not always good. There was always, you know, conflicts with the younger brothers. And, but she worked very hard and she was only like 16 to run the housekeeping. And she had to do everything, cleaning and taking care of us. It was, was very hard on her till finally she got older and then I think we got housekeepers again because she wanted to, to quit that job. I think she got engaged or whatever, but we went on with housekeepers. But the relationship with my brother and sister is all right. Of course, they're far away now, so you, but I still over the phone and whatever connections we have. At what point in your life did you become part of the gay culture? When I was about 17, and it worked in that department store where there were people working that uh, started to approach me. And by that approach, I actually discovered that there was another world also. That was when it, if you feel when they should find the first lesser experiences that was in those days, when I was working in the department store. There were a lot of people there. I also met Max Heimans, the friend that I kept till he died a few months ago, the Jewish boy. Besides the department store, where else did you meet people? Mm, actually, not much because I was young. I didn't go to bars. I didn't even know they were there. Or not, uh, never really did. I lived with my father and my. And by that time, my father was remarried. Was he actually? Let me see. No. He married after we all left the house for good. I was still there with a housekeeper. And I was staying in the house till one day I got a, and I had already a relationship with a friend that I met. And I remember then when I had a big argument with my father because he was always fighting with the housekeeper and I took up for the housekeeper. He was always, he told me, you should be a lawyer. I should have put you in law school. And I left. I still see me leaving with a tiny little black lacquer suitcase where I packed in the things I needed and I left and I went to this guy and I said, I'm gonna leave the house but I'm not gonna live here, I'm gonna rent an apartment. I was working then already in that department store. How old were you at this time? I think I was 18 or so. And I rented a small room, nothing else than a little room with a bed in it. That's all I needed. And they gave me a breakfast. And that's when I left the house from that moment on. Did you ever feel discriminated against in any way because of your choice of lifestyle? No. My father in the beginning, then he found out. But then when he found out that I lived it the right way, the neat way, the proper way, the, because there were different ways you can live that lifestyle. The same as as other people. You can be a, a, a prostitute, <laughs> you can be a nice woman, and that's the same in this life. But I lived it well and without any bad backgrounds of the whole thing, not, you know, be bad. So but that, he accepted that later on and accepted my friends, so that worked out well. What do you recall of the time in your country just prior to Hitler's invasion? Well, 
actually was, was there was war because he had war already with Poland. Do you remember when that started? Oh yes, I, I, I know the minute of it. Where were you? Very funny, I was sitting on that resort, Schevening, on an outside cafe, and then all of a sudden the news came out that Hitler invaded Poland, and it was, I'm sure it has to be on a Sunday, like in September or something. But it was quite a shock because we all knew, oh, that's the beginning. But not realizing that it would ever happen. We were no neutral. We went to World War I without a problem and never attacked us. Never even thought of it, that that ever would happen. But then we knew he was on the go. And then this uh, Sudetenland and all the Czechoslovakia and uh, uh, Austria that he picked one by one. Not realizing he would do the same thing. Not to get Holland, he was using us later on as the place to jump to England. That was why he was occupying Holland for. We're coming to the yeah. end of the first tape now. On May 27, 1998, and I want to ask you, before the invasion of your country, did you experience any changes in your day-to-day -day life? No. Tell me what happened when the Nazis came into your country. That was on May the 10th, 5 o'clock in the morning. We heard airplanes going over. Uh, the first impression was that they were just flying over to go to England, or maybe there were English planes flying over to go to Germany. We knew there was more on, on next to the, on our doorstep. So, to see a little more of all that, believe it or not, we had then all to stand on the roof, dangerous as it was, but we didn't realize what was happening and how dangerous it was. And I still remember when I was standing on the roof, I saw an airplane, but it had a big cross on, so I knew there was a German plane. Actually, just not maybe a mile away, it was shot, hurt, or uh, attacked, or shot by a Dutch. Uh, cannon or whatever and we saw the plane going down very close by so what happened everybody want to see so we went almost in our pajamas or night clothes on our little house shoes running to that place where the airplane came down I can see still the whole neighborhood running to see what happened and it was very close by and the plane had fell on a house on a street there it was a very wide street, I still remember the name of the street. And then we saw right then, it was just happened about half an hour before, and we saw some Germans coming still out of that plane, out of the burned plane, the people out. That was a whole awful scene. But it was the first time we were really, for the first time, seeing war. A plane falling on a house and a house damaged and all that. Still not realizing that we were at war. That the, that was a part of the invasion. We didn't know we were invaded. We saw that was just flying over and hit by uh, the guns going to England. And then, when we had the radio then, then we turned the radio and they said, uh, Germany has invaded Holland. And they're dropping their soldiers all over the country, not as soldiers, they are dressed in all kinds of outfits as nuns, as farmers, as women, as everything that doesn't look like a soldier and they're spreading all over the country. Be aware. Well, that was very good. But we still, I took my bicycle and I went to work because, okay, we, they're there. And then they started to stop us on the street and ask us to, to uh, say one word and that is one word that the Germans cannot say properly. It is the word Scheveningen with a <laughs> The Germans will say Scheveningen. Boy, if you said Scheveningen, they, you were arrested because they felt you're not a Dutchman. And no matter where you come from, so that was the, the clue. So I went to work and of course there was a very upset situation there on account that an invasion from Hitler meant the Jews are in danger. But 
the people that were just working with me, sales girls and all that, they couldn't do nothing. They just went to work too. But my manager didn't show up. So I think there was still another co-manager so that said, will you go on your bicycle and go to Mr. Blitz, was his name, go to his house and see what happened. So I went on my bicycle to Scheveningen. He, he lived in Scheveningen, knew where he was living. Well, nobody answered the door. I was looking through the window and I saw laundry hanging in the, in the yard. I could see through the windows. But there was no matter. Of course, he still didn't know what happened, but he was not there. And a few days later, he was not there either, till they got word, because in the first time there was still some communication, that he fled to England on a fisher boat, like a lot of people that had the money did. Some were probably already sort of prepared for this could happen. If it does happen, let's go. Because I cannot see that when they heard over the radio Hitler invaded and then all of a sudden they had everything ready to go to a fishing boat. It, it was almost like planned, like the word was already spread, Hitler may invade Holland. Don't be surprised. And that word went through certain people that got the word. So he was gone anyway. And my other manager also, there were two in the silk department, silk, uh, fabrics and one was in a wooden fabric. The two silk fabric managers both disappeared to England. So I went back to work and then we kept working. Then the whole management and the whole leadership of the store was taken over by the Germans. The whole main office in Amsterdam, they threw all the Jews out. When was this? Well, that was very shortly. That may have taken maybe two or three months after the invasion. The invasion was in May, and it may have happened already in August. What year was this? I was still with the company, yeah. What year? Oh, that was then in 1940. And What was it like when the Nazis marched in and occupied your city? Well, I don't know. I never meant to see it. I, I couldn't go out to look for that. And, uh, well, we knew that we were then occupied by this army with a uh, guy that was the head of this whole thing, that was Seiz Inquart. He was one of the big Nazis appointed by Hitler to be in, on top of the Netherlands. I mean, the leader of representing Hitler was Seiz Inquart. He was not. Well, no one was good, of course. They were all Nazis. Now, from that moment on, the misery started. We cannot say exactly how long it took for all those things till they told the Jews they have to wear the yellow star. To they walked around for quite a while before they started really winding them up and send them notes. You have to uh, start to go to this particular camp in Holland. And from that camp, well, we never really knew what happened. But then later on, we knew they were all deported from the camp. Were you ever involved in any anti-Nazi activities? Well, not really organized. Uh, everybody was anti-Nazi that was not a Nazi. It was yes or no. There was no in-between. You could not say, well, I sympathize a little bit. It doesn't exist. You are a Nazi. And you only were a Nazi, I think, were the people that from the, in our, their heart hated the Jews. That made that almost the part why you were a Nazi. Because there was no other reason to be a Nazi. Holland was not in, in, in turmoil or anything to say that the government has to go. It has nothing to do with the government. It was personal relation. It was so bad that that uncle that took us in as children, who was always so good and nice to us, who accepted my father with his Jewish girlfriend, always were there every holiday. We were all together with my father and her Jewish girlfriend, with the uncle and his wife. The moment the war started, uh, Hitler came in, the Jewish relationship was over. And he told my father, you go with a Jew. And, and it separated right away us from that family. 
Of course, we were old enough to separate. We were not babies that we had to, you know, had to accept it. And from that moment on, this relationship with these two people was completely finished. So your father continued, continued his relationship? Continued, but I, now I don't remember, and I don't know how it went, but he got another relationship with another woman, not Jewish. And I never really know, up till now, did he break up that Jewish relationship because of the pressure, or his own mind, or a love affair, because he didn't love her anymore, and he loved more that other very pretty lady. It was, and then the Jewish lady came to us and crying, and said, oh my God, it was really a, a triangle love affair. But we never saw it as a Jewish and a Christian thing, never. But unfortunately, you know, when it came that far that they were taking her away, she committed suicide. And he heard that from a doctor, a Jewish doctor that we knew, and he said she jumped in the canal and drowned herself. But I know that he was not with her then. I, it was not while he was still have this relationship. But not with the other woman either, because he broke that up too. What happened to the Jews in your neighborhood? You know, I don't recall any Jews in the last, in the years that I lived there. Yeah, there was a Jewish family there. I could now see all of a sudden. And they disappeared all of a sudden. They went underground, or they were picked up, or they registered and went to the camp. I never knew, because we didn't have much contact with those people, not because they were Jewish, because, you know, there were so many neighbors. Actually, we didn't have too much relationship with the neighbors around in our neighborhood, not much. I played with the children there when I was younger that lived there, played ball and then do all kind of little things with when you were nine and ten years old. But when I grew up, I didn't have much connection with neighbors there. What happened with the store and your work? Well, with the, st the you mean the Bianco where I worked? Well, it's still there. And I quit there because I could not stand much longer the pressure because, you know, I can talk and I was always afraid that I would say the wrong thing and I would get me or arrest me or whatever. And I didn't like it anymore. The whole atmosphere was, was not pleasant. Were there any Jews who remained working? Yeah. Till they all were called up to go. And I went one night to a little girl, her name was Yeti Phillips. And she lived, well, I went with my bicycle because she said, uh, we're leaving tomorrow, we go to Theresienstadt. Seems to be very nice there. And uh, so they're putting us there during the war, and, uh, and we'll be back. They just want to get all the Jewish people away. Uh, we don't know really why, but he wanted it that way. So I went to say goodbye, and they had their little things. I said, what do you do with everything? Well, we just lock the door, and when we come back, it's there. And I always remember that Theresienstadt when I saw that movie with uh, Gilgut and Seymour. That's, I still see them standing on that table. And, and I still see the people coming from the train that had fur coats on. And there was even, I, they showed it on TV, a little piece of uh, luggage that said Amsterdam. So there were the Dutch Jews in that, in that whole uh, group of people. And they bought the jewelry and they bought their fur coats. Because they thought, well, we have to take that with us. When we come back, we have. And it was on that table. I can still see that scene. They took everything away. And then they told him where he was going. I said, what? They promised me a room with a view on the, on the lake. Did you witness any persecution of Jews in the streets? No, no definitely not. Anything per Well, yeah. I saw once I was sitting in a sort of a, uh, 
little snack bar and there were Jews there with their stars on. And then the Dutch Nazis came in in their black uniforms and they just got them out there. And that was actually an attack that was related to your question that was really prosecuting the Jews that were sitting there quietly having a cup of coffee and a sandwich and they kicked them out of that uh, snack bar and throw them out on the street. We don't want Jews here. And you saw the signs in certain places, no Jews wanted and all that, but it was all over Europe because they had to do it or they, or they were Nazis themselves. But I think the restaurant had to do it. They had to hang that sign. Were you aware of the Nazi attitude towards homosexuals? No. We heard about it, that it happened in Germany. But, of course, again, we don't have, they didn't have communication. We didn't hear anything from nothing. There was no radio, there was no television. The newspapers had only, they were all uh, controlled by the Nazis. So there was nothing shown that would upset the Dutch. It was all hody toddy all very nice, but it was all lies too. So they didn't attack anybody, even in the newspaper. And that was all the communication you had. And I've never seen anything happening on the streets or so. Because who knows? Nobody was showing off. or, or It was never that way anyway. I mean, it was not all that craziness what you see now in San Francisco and all that that is happening there and, and in Key West that didn't exist. That is only from the last few years that they wanted to be show off that way. But I never agree with, but that's fine. Were you aware of what Order 81 was in Holland? What was? Order 81. No. No, uh, it, what is Order 81? It was the German rule law against homosexuality. Oh, that was a... No, I never heard of the expression. But I knew it was there because I remember even that Prince Bernhardt had a very close friend, Von Kram, was a tennis player, very famous tennis player. And he was attacked because he was gay, and that happened in Germany. And I, I think he got out, I don't think he was killed, but he got into big trouble because they knew or was known as such. And I remember there was a, a close friend, but a, you know, no, no relationship, of Prince Bernhard. I always remember that Von Kram was his name. What happened after you left the store? Uh, first, I got a little job in between that has nothing really. However, it was in a <coughs> sort of a store for fashion. And it was a customer that came to our department and bought fabrics there because she was making gowns and dresses in that in her business and she said I could use a man there that would sort of uh, have a little control over everything and it sounded nice but it turned out she was the lover of a German general or something but that was not too great either to be working for that so I quit that immediately I thought no I said I don't feel happy here and then I went to the government that government of The Hague that was hiring then people to uh, be connected with this whole department that gives out ration coupons for shoes and a coupon for this and a coupon for that and there had to be people to handle and I was then sitting in a big school where the people came asking for a permit to buy shoes and you have to ask all the questions, what do you need them for and all this question. And then I was later on transferred to a very big office where they started to give out the ration cards that you needed to buy food. And those ration cards you could only get if you presented your passport. And if that passport had a J on it, you knew that there was something wrong. Well, actually, I don't know. They had the J on it just to, if they were at 
on the street hall held, then they had to say they knew there was a Jew. But they knew it on the start anyway. I don't know exactly how this how this worked, why they had the jail. But I still they still talk about that now that all over Europe all the Jews had a jail on their passports and on their cards. But the the main thing is that I was able to give ration cards without getting those cards or a number or some identification. I did it without any identification. To I couldn't do it on the person that came to the, we call it the Bali, to the counter, because that was out. But there were hundreds of cards around from Jews that were hidden. And I run into a man that used to come in my department in this department store. He was a salesman to sell fabrics. He was a Jewish man. And I met him later. I don't know if it was still in the store, or if he was still, or if he was, I don't think he was wearing a star. He, th he thought, I can get away without it. And he asked me, he said, my family is hidden in Friesland on a farm, my wife and two children, and I have to get food cards for them. I said, well, and he asked me, are you working there? Is there anything that can be done? I said, yeah, I can help you with that. I don't know exactly how it went, but I was able to give him the cards and he picked them up for my house or, I don't I think my house, that he picked them up and got them to his family because he was still able to bring them to his family in, where, in, on the farm. He was in Utrecht in a house with a family, I think just man and wife, because it happened a few times it went fine all this time it worked what year was this jeez i have no idea i have no idea i think it was in 41 or 2 were jews getting rations or different rations at that time well we got carts with bread rations on it with sugar rations on it and you have to buy bread on a little coupon and you got your bread only this much or so whatever it got less and less and less and for everything was a coupon and if you didn't have a coupon you couldn't buy anything the jews have coupons we all had coupons but the jews didn't because they were hidden and they couldn't get that ration cards because they couldn't go to that office to get it but i did it under the table. I was able to get the ration cards for them because I was working there. So I mo almost stole them. Why and did you decide to do that? Because I knew the man and he, he asked me if, if I could help his family. I never met his wife and the children. I, I never n even knew. Did you think but I must have met his wife once because, but that is a later story, because I Later on, when I was arrested and I was in the cell, somebody was brought in the cell across from me and I looked through my little people and it was the lady. So I must have known her, but I don't remember how I got acquainted with her because I recognized her as the person. She was arrested later on because, okay, he didn't show up to pick up the cards. So I thought, and I knew where he was living. So I went to Utrecht. What kind of risk were you taking by doing this? A lot. But I wasn't real. I, I didn't realize it at all. Never even thought of it, because I, it came because I was not really working in a big underground organization that they started to roll up and arrested 20, 30 people all in one group. I did it all by myself, and it didn't mean anything. I never even thought about it. Also, probably with the idea, if you do that all by yourself, they never find. If you're in a big group and they, ha and they start talking, like all this business here now with drugs, they roll up and they got 10, 15 people at once. Okay, I, was, I didn't feel I was at risk. So I went to Utrecht, I went to that house, and the people said, he didn't show up for days. He must have been picked up. He's not around anymore. He's probably already 
in Germany in a camp or whatever, maybe already dead. So what are we going to do now? Because, you know, his, his children and his wife are in Friesland. Well, we don't know. But it seems that he has given his wife already instructions, if anything happened to me, there's where the cards are. And it seems that she got the notice of it. And when I was arrested and in jail, she came to the house, and I had a housekeeper then. And it seems that that housekeeper had talked the police, the Nazis, first place to get me, because when they, they arrested me once in my office, they, that was actually already forgot to tell, I was arrested. Tell me about it. Uh, one day at the afternoon, they come to Dutchmen, Dutch Nazis, not knowing they were Nazis, and asked me, we have to talk to you. And they were then questioning me about these cards and the Jews and the whole thing. Did they know? I said, yeah, I did take care of this, but I don't know there were Jews. How do I know they're Jews? They, I have so many friends that say, Henry, will you please, Hans, will you please get our cards? Because people stood in line for hours to get their cards. And I just walked in as an employee and did all that. So I had friends, neighbors that said, hey, will you get bring my cards home tonight or so. And I did that. So I had these cards with a pile of other cards that I have from other people. I didn't know they were Jews. How do I know? The other people say, well, you could have seen the J on it, that I was blind for that. And so they arrested me, and they put me in jail. They put me in the Dutch holding cell, you can call it. And that's in that holding cell that the next day, my friend, who I lived with, also came in that cell across from me. And I think they all wind up there because the policeman that handled my case was a, we call a good policeman. He was not a Nazi. And he knew where I was sitting and he probably put that friend of mine in the cell across so we could communicate. When I looked through the peephole that he was in, I made, he had a little whistle that was the unfinished symphony of that was our whistle when we, when we went to <whistles> and I whistled that and there he answered me I said Jesus are you cross for me he said yeah what happened he said they came and arrested me too because you because I lived with him and they, they searched the house and they found paraphernalia that had to do with this business. I also had a stamp from the city that I stole, what you probably could use one of these, like the city of The Hague, what was very important, and they found it in his desk. So they picked him up, but he was released. They didn't have any more proof that he did anything. And We're coming to the end yeah. of the tape now. May 27, 1998, and you were describing what it was like when you were arrested uh, the first time in the, by the Dutch police. Uh, they took me to their office and questioned me more, but I talked myself out with knowing, telling them that I didn't know they were Jews. But they put me in the cell anyway, and I was uh, locked up. Actually, yeah, sort of. What now? What now? I, I couldn't do nothing. I was just sitting there, not knowing what would, could I didn't even realize that could be the first step of the end. If that would accumulate to something that would, they could blow up things the way they wanted it and put you also in a concentration camp. If they knew you were helping Jews, they said, well, if you feel so much for them, you're going to be in the same category. Did anybody know you were what you were doing? Well, my friend did, and that housekeeper. And for some reason, oh, for some reason, she found it necessary to tell the police about that, and that was how it all started. But we found that out much later after I came back because I heard from other people they saw her in the vicinity of that office where those police came from 
and not anybody else because you know you don't make that public anyway so nobody else knew then he and uh, uh, the lady he meaning your part your uh, roommate yeah the roommate was of course because he was aware of the whole thing did he um try to convince you in any way no that it was no dangerous? no no he he f he said well whatever you want to do this is fine with me as long as, as you feel like helping those people it's good i think a lot of people had those little individual things happening by helping here and there somebody you know even there are so hundreds of people that had maybe just one person in their house hidden but it never even was mentioned even after the war it was not such a big deal it was just having somebody in the house of course it turned out later on that it was a crime how long did you stay in jail uh, first I was in that holding cell but from that cell I was released to go home and that was, I think, in about th maybe three weeks. I don't remember exactly how long it was. And I went home, and I still see having lunch because it was about 11 o'clock with that lady, the housekeeper, and my friend. And while I was sitting there, I said, you know, I never got my passbook back. I forgot to pick that up when I left. And without that passport, you're dead. You needed that to get your ration cards. I said, well, I go this afternoon back to the office there, to that police office, and get my car. And I went there. And that card was in the German section. And when I asked for that card, the same two guys that arrested me in the beginning knew I was there and they said, what are you doing here? I said, I was released this morning. Oh yeah? Okay, come with us. I thought I got a heart attack. They put me in a room, said sit down and wait. And I sat there about three hours dying from fear and what is happening now? And they went to headquarters of the Gestapo telling that I was released and I was somebody, very probably somebody that has much more to talk about the underground and how many other people were related to this so they could uh, make more arrests. So I was sitting and waiting and sweating carrots. They came back, they said, you go back where you came from. And they put me right back in cell number 19. I never forget the number. <laughs> and I, this was, I always say, what was ever the worst thing that happened in your life, that that was the worst thing that happened in my life. And blaming myself that I went back to walk into their arms. And then they had to put me back in that Dutch holding cell. So the Dutch policeman said, are you back again? What happened? He said, well, ask him what happened. I'm here again. He said, well, as bad as it is, the only thing, we have to make this round. The best thing is that you go now to the, they call it the Hotel of Orange. That was the big jail in Scheveningen, where they put everybody that was really in the underground. And also, a lot of Jews was put in that jail. Well, I said, I'm not too happy about that. He, it's the only way, and we try to get you out, but you have to go. Well, it was not so pleasant, and he brought me there, delivered me to the people that were in charge there, and they put me there in a cell. There were already two guys in there. There were two farmers that had slaughtered their own cow, and you were not allowed to do that because everything was for the Germans and to eat and they had a cow there said well the hell with you this cow is going to die are we going to eat it well they found out and they arrested they put him in the cell and i was with them the two dumb guys i remember one was 
very religion and he was running back and forth with a rosary, praying and praying. I said, since you're walking, uh, pray a little for me, there are enough beads on it. <laughs> he said, well, I should pray for you. He said, well, you better do it. So I was with those three guys in jail, and we, once we were taken out to get fresh air, they brought us in a, in a sort of a courtyard where we had to walk. And then it was so obvious, it was very bad that you saw the Jews that were there, they were used to empty all the dirt, the, 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 the garbage, or the, you have to do your business on a, on a, a tub or something. And they had to go to all the cells and clean what the Jews had to do. They were already in bad shape. And many times that in the middle of the night you heard the cell doors go open and people were taken out of their cells and brought out on transport. And that's just a nice experience there. But uh, I was just sitting there and uh, all you, I remember the food was always a very good soup. <laughs> very thick. <laughs> but you found everything good with all you had. And I was also uh, asked questions. I had to come out one day also with an officer asking questions, and I told him the same thing. He said, I did something. Maybe it was wrong, but I didn't know it was wrong. I just did that for people that gave me my car. I told him the story, not ever mentioned the word Jew. And it was. I don't know, the whole thing was about three months that I was in jail. Because I think it is in January that they picked me up. And in the end of March, well, it was only like two and a half months, one of the days the door goes open and he said, Henry de Krieger, and I had to stand up like that because every time they open the door you have to get up and you don't have to salute, but you have to get up. He said, you released. So I still look at goodbye, and I still hear him, say, because no, he still say, come out. He didn't say you released. He said, come out. I said, oh my God, another questionnaire of us. So he walked next to me and said, you go home. Oh my God, I could kiss the man. <laughs> so I got my things. I walked out, a tiny little green door, but it's still there, and I see that all the time. I always tell my family, that's the little door I came out, and then I, walked, I didn't have any money on me, and I walked all the way where I finally found a little grocery store, and I told them, I said, I'm coming, I'm hoping that they were good people, I said, I'm coming out of jail, I have to make a call, can I get 10 cents, because I have no money on me. So I made the call to my friend, and he said, okay, I'll be right out with the bicycle, and we met, and he put me in back of the bicycle, took me back home. But immediately, the moment I came home, I said, I don't want to stay here. I'm so afraid. And I think the same afternoon, the trains were still running. I went to Amsterdam and stayed there in a house for a while. I don't remember how long, till I felt, OK, I think now it's about safe to go back home. Whose house did you stay at? With a, a girl that was working in the same office as my friend, and she was also very very good anti-Nazi and anti-German and all that. And her parents lived in Amsterdam. Said, let's put Hans to Amsterdam with my parents. And he is out of the Hague, and nobody knows where he is. I don't know how I got there, but I still think on the train. Did you ever go back to the rations office? No, that was after the war. It was finished. That was over. I don't know what actually happened. No, saying uh, during the war, did you go back to work? I don't it? even know. No, oh, no. The moment I came out, I had to un go underground myself because I was so young that they were picking up every man to send to Germany to go in a work camp. And I stayed in the house with my friend, and we went through this whole business of being picked up. And on the November the 4th, that was in 19, when was that? What year? 1944, I think. They told every young man, I think every man, to step out their door in front of their house to be picked up, to be transported. He said, yeah, the hell with you, we're not doing that. 
And he too, he was supposed to go, and he was older than I am. And we did have for a while in the house a big closet, and we made a wall in there. So you could go behind that, and put, somebody had to put the wall back. It was like a fake wall. But then we heard that the Germans knew this trick, and everywhere the one they took was a bayonet and went through those do those walls. So that was not safe. If you sit there, you get a bayonet in your body, it wouldn't be so pleasant. So I said, that is not going to work. We had to find another way. So that's when we decided, because we knew that this was coming. They already announced that a week before, on November the 4th, you have to get ready to go. And uh, we had two desks. One was on the second floor, first floor, and the one was on the second floor. That had, like, the top, and then two cabinets with doors, and behind the doors were drawers on each side. And what we did, we cut off the drawers that only the front was visible. And the whole back was then empty. And we moved the top from the desk, we got in that hole and closed the top again. And, we were, and then there was a door, so you open the door, you still see nice drawers. You won't have any idea that this was no, there was a space behind it. And we did it in both desks. I was in one desk and he in another desk. And there was, we asked a girlfriend to be in the house, so when the Germans came, she could tell them, yeah, they live here, but they're gone. They left the house a few days ago, because one had his birthday, because November the 4th, my birthday was October the 30th, and there was still a bouquet of chrysanthemums. I don't know how in the war we still got chrysanthemums. They were there, and they were sort of falling out, because we shook them out. They haven't been here a few days, but uh, I'm here now because I know you were coming and telling you that uh, they're not here. And we saw them through the little strip. We saw the Germans walking through the house. And they left, and they believed it. But you know, you have to sit up all night. You couldn't even go to bed or sit anywhere. Because they would go to the chair and feel if the chair was warm. Those bastards. So we got out of bed real, real good. And then it went over again. They, 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 I think they, for the 5,000 men, I think they got one or none. Everybody was hit and nobody. There were really sabotage there. Nobody did anything to please those guys or, or give up. It was remarkable. Did you ever hide anyone in your home? Well, only for a few days that Max Heimans was the friend that I met when I was working in that department store. He was working there also. And we were only like 17 or 18 years old then. And uh, he was sometimes visiting me. And I remember the day that he got the message that he has to go to that camp in Holland to be transported. And he said, not me. Are you crazy? Can you see me in a camp? I go, no, no, no. And he had to go, let's say, the next day. So he st they stayed in our house for quite a while. Not too long, because it, it was his me around. Uh, it was not safe. It was not like a little family with men and wife where there would never be any trouble. Because when there were men, they would come up and pick him up and transport him. So he was staying very shortly till he f found an address where he would be safer. Did you realize you were putting yourself at risk by hiding him? No. Again, I don't know. We never even thought about that. But uh, maybe if you thought about it, you may not have done it. I, I wouldn't be that feeling like I'm such a hero. I do all those things knowing that I'm going to die. I don't no, I never felt that way. I, I always did it because it was a normal thing to do, you know, and we never th realized how dangerous it could be. I don't think we weren't aware of that, or it was not that much known that you got shot for everything. Later on, they were much meaner in the very beginning, because this is all in the beginning, that's only in 41. But like in 44, if anything happened, that was happened also in, when I was in jail, when anything would happen to, let's say, a German soldier, they took out boys from that jail where I was in, they put them to the spot where this soldier was killed, and they killed those five, six boys right on the spot. We have still houses in The Hague where you have plaques on the walls that here died those boys in represailles 
for whatever happened. And that happened many times. That's why they were so mean they got later. In the beginning, it was not all that mean. We didn't hear about that. Let me go back to that time when you hid your friend Max. What did you do for food for him? Well, no, that was uh, in that time when he was in our house, the food was normal. We had food enough to feed him, and it was not, it was so short that it was not even a matter of, oh my God, now we don't have enough to eat. No, that was never a question. But the, 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 the thing was, when I was arrested, they found a letter from him, and he was already hidden somewhere. And he wrote me a letter, and he signed it with a lady's name. I forgot what's his name, Marguerite or something. And the police found that letter and said, who is this? He said, oh, that's a girlfriend of mine that is, uh, lives in, it was signed Amsterdam, or I don't know what, I don't know exactly, but they found that letter. I remember very well that they were asking questions about him, but the name Max never came up because he signed it with a phony name. And then, like, uh, he went to a few different addresses, finally wound up an address in Amsterdam, and I was there after the war when a little nephew walked in and told him that his father and mother had died in Bergen Belsen. And he was not shocked. He said, I knew that already. I got now, you know, you're telling me, but since they were never, they never came back, because it was already weeks and weeks after the liberation, and he said, I didn't expect them to come back, so. How long did you remain underground? Oh, myself, actually since I came out of this, that must have been about two, two and a half years that I, but I was not too much really hidden, you know. I, in the neighborhood, I still came out because I was in the neighborhood. If you lived in the city itself, then you, there was never a policeman on the street. There was never a, a, a German. You never saw anybody. So I could still go from... Also, there was one woman that was selling eggs and sometimes meat. And I went there and I bought two eggs or so, a dollar a piece. Did the neighbors know? Oh, the neighbors, yeah. And she was a German woman, believe that. And a, a German lady, what was her name? Mrs. Schindler, of all names. Her name was, I remember Mrs. Schindler. But she was a funny lady. Yeah. And then what happened? Well, actually, where are we? Uh, let me see if there was anything connected to all that. Nothing more serious happened, luckily. What happened to the family that you had been getting rations for? You said the husband Well, didn't she was arrested. Maybe her kids survived. Because when I saw her coming in that cell across from me, and I asked her, how did that, what happened? She says, I was arrested in your house. The moment I rang the bell and I walked in, the police was there. So that woman must have told the police. She must have told that she was coming. And that woman had called the police, or called or where, I don't know if, there, I don't even remember if we had a phone or not. But she was arrested and also put away. But I never knew about what happened to the children, so I never even knew where they were. But that, so it, my, my, it's a whole big story and we went through a lot of things, but the amount of people that are involved are very small. I didn't go with big groups of people that know. Uh, it's all very personal and very small, and but still made an impact. You know, it, it was a, a very little thing that you could do. For the rest, you couldn't do nothing. You just sit and wait. And then we got bombed. The, the section of my town where I live was bombed by the English. Uh, that was quite a terrible experience. Half of our neighborhood burned down. Lucky my house was saved. But that was almost the, the end of the war because it, it happened in uh, what it was, March. No, it happened in March 44, and we got liberated in May 45. So we still were, about a year and a half, we were in a terrible 
area with all bombed out houses and all it was horrible. What were you doing during that time? Nothing. Actually nothing. Luckily my friend still had a job. He was an, uh, an uh, redacteur, a writer for an automobile magazine like AAA and they had ma a magazine he wrote for that magazine. So he, he got an income because I got nothing, nobody, I was not supposed to, to exist. What was better, the more the, the least they knew about you, the better it was. And uh, so we went through this bombardment, what was awful, and then finally came the day of the liberation. That we heard that uh, they signed the, the peace contract in Arnhem, it was Wageningen. It was quite a relief. Where were you when you heard the war was over? Home, in my house, with, with my friend. Oh, God. Can you describe that day? Mm, now, let me now recall everything exactly. What? Where, where I was? Where was it during the bombardment? Yeah, that was in the Jan Peterson Quartet, so. You know, I don't remember much of it. It, it made such an enormous impact that you were living in a cloud. It was such a dream <coughs> that finally <coughs> all that was over, the fear. Uh, we were surrounded by bombardments all day. I had a big, heavy table that I put against the wall with a big tablecloth on the top and, and pillows in it, and every time the serenes were, uh, whoop, I went under the table and was sort of sitting with the, with the pillows that I thought, if they hit the house, maybe I'm safe. And there was a fear every day, every day. And then the, the uh, missiles went off, and sometimes you hear them zzzz, and then they stopped, and then you know they were falling back. They were, they were not good, and they fell also on homes all over the place. There was so much fear and hunger. How to survive from food? There was nothing on the end. Nothing. We ate uh, tulip bulbs. And we had a little stove, this big, with a little hole inside. And you put everything in there that burned. We had a beautiful piece of furniture. I still see that. Very baroque, heavy mahogany. And I thought, well, you're very pretty. But I'm afraid you have to go. We have to eat. And we cut that piece up in tiny little pieces and then put it in that little stove so we could cook whatever was to cook. There was hardly anything, you know. And we have to change things, clothes. My friend went on a bicycle all the way to the farms to see if he could get a little butter or maybe a few potatoes or whatever the farmers had. And then that's how you had to survive. Or you got maybe a little piece of bread for the whole week. I don't even remember how we made it, but you know what is also, you adjust. When I was in jail, I thought, how can I ever adjust to a life in a cell? But I did. And when there is no food, I think your stomach starts to shrink and everything adjusts. I don't think too many people really died of hunger. Well, maybe some did that already never had anything. My father had hunger, Udin. He blew up this much because all my father had was beans, and they ate beans, and it seems to be very bad for your system, and you blow up, and he was like that. Not from health, but it was a sickness. He was like a little Michelin man, you know, from all the rubber band. It was awful, but it went away. Were you in contact with your father yeah. and brother and sister? Not much with my... my not much with my brother. I don't even know my brother. I think he went to Finland. I think they deported him to Finland. They had to work in Finland. Or he went uh, by himself and they said, uh, some people did if they were transported or sent to somewhere where they felt safer than home, they said, the heck with it, I go there and see what happened. And I really never knew and I hate to ask him. We're coming to the end of the tape now. May 27th, 1998. Where did you go after the liberation? 
nowhere. <laughs> Stayed home and, uh, and sort of realized that it was over. And, but we never went anywhere. But I had to go back to work, of course. Where did you go back? And to work? I went back to the same business that I left before the war. I went back to that department store, but I started to work in Rotterdam because Rotterdam built it, reopened, it was bombed. And they rebuilt the building and opened up the store again. So it was quite a while after the war, you couldn't go boom, 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 right away to work. It, it took quite before we finally all got sort of uh, ready for things, you know. Didn't realize what you could do, you have to make up your mind. Anyway, I always like to be in the retail business, so I went there and the big manager there was the man that survived the war, Mr. Pollack, that survived the war. He was my chef in The Hague and, uh, you know, he disappeared, but he survived. And he took me in and I became a salesman. And I was again in the fabric department, selling there. And, but it was a crazy time because all the fabrics were rationed also. You couldn't just go and buy fabrics. And they were standing in line every day, I don't know how many women, to get maybe two yards or three yards of a certain, there was only one roll of fabric, wool. And everybody only got that much. But a lot of that stuff went in the black market. They bought it for the regular price, and an hour later they were selling it already for three or four times the price. And uh, I had a, I had several friends, of course, and one had a, fa a mother and a sister, and they said, "Oh my God, I wish I could have some fabric for them." I said, "Well, listen, I'll." I'll get something for you. I'm in the department, so I'll come to the store and uh, I'll give you, you know, a, a ratio, maybe two or three pieces. I could do that. So he came and I gave it to him. And I don't know how that happened, but they found out that I gave more than I was supposed to give. And I first, oh no, I didn't do it, but then I found on the back side of the of the sales tip, those three amounts added up. And that killed me because they found out I sold three pieces of instead of one. But it costed me my job. He let me go because of that. I said, my God, years ago I was let go. You may be let go because you didn't sell enough. Now you let go because you sell too much. What was shocking, I, I can still see that I was going from Rotterdam on the train to The Hague, where I was living. And I came home and said, guess what? I lost my job. Couldn't believe it. Well, and then I took a job in the, uh, like in Holland, you have the Book of the Month Club. And I had a friend working there. He was there, a writer or one of the big managers there. And he could use somebody in the showroom to also uh, wait on the members of the club and also do display with books. And I was very good in that. I made gorgeous display with books and you cannot do much with books but I did something with it. And that was a very nice job. I was there for many, many years. I think I was, how long did I work there? I think 12 years or something. Till we met people that asked us, come to America. And that's how we went to America. Our sponsor that we met in on a vacation in Mallorca. And I said, I'll help you to come to America. Who did you go with? Who did you go to America with? With John, the yo. And where did you meet him? At a concert. In a concert hall in Scheveningen. One, one it was a sort of a, every Monday night there was a special concert for a very special price for a concert for the people, like they have here. Uh, it was here in uh, where was it in Boston, Boston Pops. It was something like that. And there he was with his friend, and I was alone. And we got introduced, and from one thing came another. And then 
that was the beginning and it was on uh, June 17 about 52 years ago now and we still know the music that was playing there was the violin concerto of Lalo <laughs> we always think of that anyway and then uh, and I was still living with the friend that we went through the war with but you know things change and uh, so it changed a lot and I decided to move in with John who was then uh, in the same house with his uncle that he was moved in when he was a child and we lived there for a few years very nice beautiful little apartment with a lot of friends till we got this whole thing of going to America and we he said all of a sudden why don't we go who gets that opportunity go to Miami Florida beautiful beaches every day we can go to the beach well, I think we went 10 times since we're here now for 30 years. <laughs> what did you do in, in Miami? In Miami, I first got a job, believe it or not, I made shell souvenirs. I had, we got right away friends because of our sponsor, we had a lot of friends, so right away we were smack in the middle of a lot of people, very nice. And one said, oh, I get you a job. I, uh, I'm with uh, Florida Power and Light and the cost from our office is a place where they make souvenirs and you, you can do that. So I made, started to make souvenirs. They were souvenirs made out of shells. You have a big abalone shell and in the abalone shell you put a figurine. Oh no, the shell was up, you know, like this. And you put a figurine, it was usually a Madonna surrounded by little shells and a little shell in the front a bigger shell with a little light and those people went with those souvenirs on the coastline selling them on the beaches and i made thirty dollars a week and what was your primary occupation here in florida nothing this was my my first job that i had no but in your major the amount of time that you worked here in Florida, what did you? Then I went from there to John and Marsh, and I went there with my book experience to see if I got a job at John and Marsh, and they took me in the book department because I knew books. I told them right away, "Yeah, I know books, but I, I never read one, especially not all those English books. I can read the flap because it's very hard to." suggest certain books you know it's very hard you have to get the, to know what's in the book the review and the whole thing but next of the book department was the gift shop and i always wandered off to the gift shop and started to display they also had a section of uh, artificial flowers that were plastic in those days and i started to make plastic arrangement and there was a woman working there and i criticized her said you don't this is a lousy arrangement you should do this and that anyway i was moved from the books to the gift shop and I did all the displays there and then I uh, saw an ad in the paper they asked for a manager in a shop on Miami Beach and I was working with a girl uh, who wanted to change I said why do you go to that place they, they, say, ah, they asked for a manager maybe it's, uh, try it and she went there and she comes back the next day said did you get the job no, but I think you got. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I knew already I couldn't do what they were asking, but I knew that you can do it, and I told them. I said, I'm working with a guy that will be just perfect for you. So call him up. So I called him up. I got the job, and I worked there for 30 years at Nessa Goldwa. <laughs> and I did all the displays, and I was a manager in Lincoln Road till I had to spend so much time on this play that I couldn't do the, the rest of the management. Let me ask you, how do you think your experiences during the war affected your life? To be grateful for anything. To eat, to be alive, to see things so different. That, that is the, actually the only reason why you think back of the war. That you have everything, well, especially here, but now in Holland too, the luxury 
that you were surrounded with that we had to and you we had nothing so <laughs> you can imagine first place to be alive to be healthy sort of uh, be able to make it so well here without really too much trouble we were always lucky we always said we have guardian angels over our head always everything that we try to do always happened for the good and I think that has a lot to do with maybe how you lived and how you behaved I don't know how you are blessed and I know it's not blessed because his mother did that and I did that stupid little not stupid the little thing I did I don't think that has anything to do with being so protected by uh, everything how we got this house I mean how lucky can you be looking back to your experiences during the war and the people you helped would you have done anything differently no would you again do you think you would yeah. help a persecuted person oh yeah and even uh, wishing you could do more because even if I tell you again we I didn't even realize what you were doing it, it didn't mean anything I didn't do it with the idea of no I'm gonna help those people it, it, it fell in your lap to do it and it, it was uh, it could be done so why not you know it didn't take much effort to do it I didn't have to go far out of my way to get things done that had to be done you know I, I, I didn't have to blow up a bridge that is that is a little more to do than just getting a few ration cards for somebody it, it's nothing do you talk about what you've done to people do you tell them if it comes up it, not often I don't have to because I won't say you don't have to bragging is not the word but if you because sometimes it comes up about jail you know being in jail or going about jail I said well or I said well when I was in jail uh, there was one thing that I always bring up and it was very typical when I was in that cell there was nothing else than a Bible and not being religious or anything but there was nothing else I took that Bible and started to open it and reading it and I found parts in that Bible that were so close to what happened to me you know all this what, what is in the Bible written I never read the Bible in my life I never knew what was in there what a big story it is actually and it was so close to what happened to me and I was reading more and more the Bible and I started also to pray before I went to sleep and the strange thing is and that's how I got to talk sometimes to people how you got into things and then drop it because after I came out of jail I dropped the whole Bible again you know that I, I actually you know why I bring it up because so many of those criminals all of a sudden when they're in jail they turn Christian they all become Christians and, and believers and that's what I say you know how that happened because it happened in a way to me I didn't only I didn't go overboard and there was nothing else to hold on and you knew there seems to be something and the Bible tells you that and that is there was nothing I couldn't hold on to the the pot or to the table there was the Bible that were telling you all kind of things that happened to anybody and uh, one of the person in the Bible was me but I feel always sort of bad that I dropped it are there any incidents that happen either before the war during the war or since that I have not asked you about that you'd like to bring up now no I think we covered from A to Z I think what message would you send to people 
about helping others in need? First place, you have to be able to do it. Some people are just not able to help, either not able to talk the way that people need sometimes to be talked to, that they just don't have that uh, in them to give good advice, but you have to have uh, maybe money. That I would love to help people with money. I always say when I lo uh, get the, the lottery, I know what to do with that money. Many things, because you know so many people that you could really help with that. And then also, for I don't know if this is part of the question, maybe not that I would say that uh, respect for people and respect for older people, respect for sick people, uh, almost everybody, and there is, there's not much of that. Of course that has nothing to do actually with your question asking me what would you do for people, but this is more an advice to other people. Thank you. It has been a privilege to share your testimony with you. Well, it was to be a, almost a pleasure to be able to get it from A to Z. I always usually come from A to maybe D or so, and then it stops. <laughs> what are we going to do now? Tell me who is sitting next. Pay attention next to the lady. Who is sitting next to you? To me? Uh, John de Vries, it used to be Joop de Vries, but now it's John over the mm. years. Mm. Knowing him for a few years, as a matter of fact, 52 years. Too long. Is there anything special you would like to say about him? <sighs> well, <laughs> he is a good companion. And we have a lot of things in common that works beautiful, but there are many things that he doesn't like to listen to an opera, he doesn't like to beautiful music. So that is where we sort of uh, split. But for the rest, you know, you after all those years, you get so used to living with each other and give and take. That is with every relationship, I think. And you get more than you take. That's the secret. Oh, well, see. That's well. all right. He has other thoughts that I have. But anyway, and uh, th you know who that is? This is one of the one of the children. This is Ponya. And there's another one that she disappeared. Hey, hey Ponya. Look at that. Isn't that adorable? <laughs> Listen. Animals are the best thing to have around. They don't talk back. They give you lots of love. And they also keep you busy. Thank you. You're very welcome. Our pleasure. Maybe it was yours up to mine. Who is in this picture? Those are my father and mother, probably taken when they were, I think, in their late 20s or early 30s. Uh, my father is Andre, and my mother's name was Cor, short from Cornelia. Where was it taken? It must have been taken in Rotterdam. Who is this a picture of? Uh, this is a picture of my sister, Eugenie, my brother, Kees, and myself on the right. That was taken probably when I was nine or ten years old, also taken in Rotterdam. What is this a picture of? This was the picture of the uh, kids, girls and boys in the elementary school uh, when I moved to The Hague. I'm the boy on the, all the left with the little sailor outfit, all the way on the left in the middle. And uh, it must have been about in fifth grade, fourth or fifth grade. I think I must have been there about nine.
Tell me about this picture. This was taken, uh, I think, when I was about 21, 22. It was taken in The Hague. Tell me about this picture. This picture uh, is of our Max Heimans and myself taken before the war when he was living in The Hague on a I was rooming somewhere when he was working at the big department store and uh, he was there not older than maybe 18 years old. The funny thing is that I remember that day he just found out that there was a fabulous no oil to put on your face to get a good suntan and uh, the name of the oil was Ambre Solaire. He said, Hans, let's put up Ambre Solaire and stand in the sun and you'll be brown in, in two minutes. And it was on that balcony that he stood both in the sun. Unfortunately, he Tell me about these books. Those books are the trilogy. The original is Gone with the Wind, translated in Dutch. And they were uh, presented to me when I was in jail to read and to have some communication with the person that brought them to me. Uh, but you could not have letters. He used every page of the book and put under the letters just a little dot. He started first with a needle print, a needle uh, point. What do you call it? A needle? To put with a needle a little under each letter. But then it turned out that after the, uh, on the other side of the page, the, the same hole came through, so that didn't work. So later on we used every page to put just two or three letters marked so we could have communication that way. It formed on the end almost a letter, but letter by letter on each page. It was very, but that's actually why I brought them to America because that was the souvenir that I have on the time that I was in jail in Holland. What is this bottle? This bottle is the original way the Dutch Geneva is packed in this cox and balls is very famous and uh, when we celebrated the 50 years celebration of our liberation, Balls came out with a special yeah. bottle and on the label on the bottom it tells you here that this is in memory of the liberation of Holland. That's why that label and each bottle is marked with a number, they are numbered edition. So therefore we never going to drink it as thirsty we may be to drink it up but we won't. <laughs> we'll get you drunk anyway.